It's always very embarrassing when you hear someone read your profile like that, because it always sounds a lot more flowery than it actually is. Uh, anyway, so you know who I am. Um, before I get into you know, being in company and why it's relevant for us to talk about this topic, perhaps, you know, allow me to indulge in a little bit of an experiment. Show of hands, uh, if you please, people who are right now working for a private equity fund or have, in their previous life, worked for a private equity fund. As expected. Right? <laughs> now, it's, 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 it's sad, but it's, it's the nature of, uh, of, uh, of private equity in Malaysia. Uh, next, show of hands if you're working for an investment banking house or a management consulting firm and have done some work advising PE funds before. There you go. One. Francesco, you need to hand. <laughs> um, show of hands if you have some form of knowledge, any kind, about what private equity is. Good. More hands now. I'm glad. Okay. Good. Uh, so what is private equity? I guess what I'll do is I'll spend the first couple of minutes, a little more than that, to talk a little bit about being in company and why this topic is relevant for being in company. Uh, and then I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the trends that we're now seeing in private equity, uh, specifically in Asia and in Malaysia, uh, a little bit of a global context as well. And then spend some time right at the end talking about how private equity firms are now changing their model to make money. Uh, where, you know, in the past, the model for making money was actually relatively simple. The private equity firms of the future are going to have to shift their models before they can actually earn the kind of returns that they're earning. Any guesses? What is the average top? quartile performing fund globally. What is the average IRR for a top quarter performing fund? P fund. Okay, so this is top quarter. This is not the P best performing fund. This is the average of the top quarter. It's 27% IRR, net IRR. Okay. If you have a fund that returns you 27% IRR, let me know because I want to put money in there. Good, Bain and Company. Who we are, I think some of you will be familiar with Bain & Company. We're a global management consulting firm. Been around since 1973. Uh, in fact, we've actually been around in Malaysia since 1983. Our very first project in Malaysia was when Guinness Anchor, uh, Guinness bought Anchor Berhad to turn it into Guinness Anchor Berhad. A number of people, including uh, some of our London-based consultants, flew out here, did the whole bunch of integration, uh, and helped create what is now a relatively successful company. Um, Bain and Company's the office is relatively new. We've only been established as a corporate entity in 2008. We've actually been doing work, as I said before, for a long time here now, but it was only in 2008 that we set up this office here. Why is private equity important to us? Well, I would claim that we sort of make the market in private equity advisory work. Um, if you go through the list of funds, and this is a U.S. example, by the way. This is a, a, a chart of all the big funds in the U.S. divided into the kind of the size of funds. So if you like, the groups on the extreme left, those are the big funds. The Carlisle's, the KKR's, Bain Capital, Wobble Pinkus, Apollo. Um, we work for all of them, right? And we work for all of them, not on an exclusive basis, but by and large, we work for them in diligence, we work for them in fund strategy, we work for them in for portfolio management. Um, and you can see across the group, we do have exposures to a lot of this. We created this market largely because Bain Capital was formed. Um, and some of you may know Bain Capital. One of its founding partners is a gentleman named Mitt Romney, who is now running for the second time uh, the presidential elections in the U.S. Uh, Steve Pagliuca, a very successful uh, Bain, Bain partner who left to uh, join the original founders of Bain Capital. He, by the way, now owns the Boston Celtics, which is a very successful basketball, basketball club. A number of very uh, 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 successful partners from Bain and Company have gone on to found some of these uh, firms that you have at Bain Capital. We'll have founders that were from Bain and Company. Texas Pacific Group, TPG, has some founders from there. Golden Gate Capital, Pacific Equity Partners, and so on and so forth. And when they went over, especially in the early days of Bain Capital, when they needed help, they came to Bain, right? So if they had an asset they were looking at and they wanted someone to kind of have an independent perspective to support them with due diligence, they came to Bain and Company. And in that sense, we sort of started this market on private equity consulting, private equity advisory. 
Uh, in Southeast Asia, in Malaysia, we are also very active in the private equity scene. Uh, these are not all public domain uh, deals that we've done in Southeast Asia in the last 18 months. It's not exhaustive. But I'll give you a flavor of some of the deals that we've done here. Uh, if you look through the list, you could probably make up some of these deals that we've worked at in the, uh, in the last 18 months. Enough about talking about Bain. Let me start with and a little slide on some well-known brands here. Can anyone tell me what's the, what is the common binding theme with all these relatively famous household brands? Franchise. Say? There are FMCGs. Okay, yeah, relatively. Any, any other offers? Food. Sorry? Food. Food. Some of them are. Yeah. <laughs> Drivers is not. <laughs> well, all these well-known brands have, in some stage of their life history, been owned by a private equity fund. Right? Drivers, you know, a very well-known Malaysian diaper brand, was bought in the early stages by a local private equity fund called Nevis Capital. Uh, they did some fantastic things to it. Uh, when they exited, Nevis Capital made a lot of money out of it. Uh, Nevis Capital, of course, bought Dome Cafe, uh, a very well-known coffee chain here. But you have you know, some of the other brands as well. Ducati was bought by TPG, turned it around, and then it's now much more uh, solid, in both, both in financial and strategic position, from the time when they bought when they bought them. So a lot of private equity owners are active owners of some of the brands that you may or may not have heard of. Private equity, though, is just one of several asset classes that are out there for financial investors, right? So in Malaysia itself, you have private equity. Uh, you will have sovereign wealth funds. You know, Kazana is a classic example of a sovereign wealth fund. Kazana does do some parts of private equity. Government investment corporations like PNB, uh, public investment companies, private financial holdings, hedge funds. So a whole range of different financial investors that are out there. Private equity is one type of it, and you'll see in a short while from the example that I will give, you know, the type of deals that a PE fund will do, and therefore, you know, what makes it special and what makes it different from some of the other asset classes here. Some trend information about private equity. Uh, the, this chart here is a chart of the global bio yield value from 1995, and as you can see, it kind of went through two waves a wave that sort of peaked roughly around the dot com, the end of the dot com group, and then crashed as well. Uh, and then another one that sort of peaked all the way in 2006, 2007, when you know, the, the deals that we were reading in the newspaper and the press at that stage, we were talking about big, you know, mega million dollar, mega billion dollar deals, right? Hilton going off for 30 plus billion dollars, the Hertz Corporation going away for 30 plus billion dollars, SunGuard, um, and, and so on and so forth. Some very, very large deals were being done in the 06, 07 period that were essentially a, a lot of access capital trying to chase some very, very small number of deals. Uh, there was also a very interesting period in 96, 97, 98, actually in Asia and in Southeast Asia. We saw back then a, a, heightened, a heightened activity of deals in Southeast Asia, in Malaysia. So, you know, as an example, when uh, Ibra in Indonesia was trying to sell off Toyota Astra, which is this large conglomerate in Indonesia. Four private equity companies came in and looked at it, very interested in actually taking over. It was a platform for them to sort of build some presence there. Um, unfortunately, there was that big crash in 08, 09. I mean, it kind of went down to very, very low valuations. There was not a lot of uh, activity going on. And part of the reason was because the dry powder had run up. Right, the dry powder, all the funds that were raised prior to 06, 07, they'd all been used up. Right? Because a lot of the investments that happened in 06 and 07, those were big equity checks. You know, $30 billion is a huge equity check. And then when that was all used up, it crashed. But the other thing was because debt was unavailable in that period. I mean, if you recall, three years ago, interest rates were at its peak. And so for private equity lending, which is probably one of the highest grades in terms of debt. Uh, it, was, it just became very, very difficult for PE funds to go out and raise debt capital. Um, and so in the past, when you could probably leverage up to 
in the 08-09 period, you were talking about effectively leveraging only about 40 to 50 percent. So for that, you then needed to write that much larger equity ticket, and that was actually very, very uh, challenging for some of the funds to do. Now we've seen some recovery in 2010, but let me let me get into a little bit more of that uh, in this next chart. So two parts of the chart here. The line basically shows the number of deals, deal count, right? And then the deal value are on the bar. So you'll see from sort of Q1, Q2, Q3, 08, or sort of that drop, and it basically dropped down to almost nothing in Q9, and sorry, in 2009. We've seen some recovery in 2010, you know, it went up to about 58 billion in Q4 of 2010. And we thought that that recovery was going to continue. And obviously, you know, all the signs came around summer of this year that we're in for another very tough period. And so deal value started dropping again. And you know, deal value kind of sort of held steady around the time. This, however, is a very different picture from the trough that we saw in 08 09. And this was because if you look at dry powder that's out there, sorry, dry, when I say dry powder, it's basically uninvested capital, right? People, the, the funds that have been raised but haven't yet been invested. The dry powder out there is huge. And there's a lot of money out there that's waiting for the right set of assets to come along to be picked up, number one. Number two is leverage. I mean, right now, the debt market is, the debt, uh, market is actually still very healthy. Right. You can go out there, despite you know, what we're seeing in, the, in, in, the, uh, in both the equity and the debt capital markets, there is still an ability for private equity funds to go out there and raise debt capital. And then the last part is, is, is targets. Right? We are now starting to see valuations drop, right? especially if there are valuations that have huge exposures to some of the more volatile markets in the, in the world. Valuations are starting to drop. This, by the way, is very, very similar to you know, when I was starting out in the world of private equity back in the Asian financial crisis in 1997, 98, right? I'll give an example of a deal that I worked on back in 97, 98 period, which led to enormous returns for a private equity fund. This was for TPG, Texas Pacific Group. Uh, the target was Korea First Bank, right? So kind of like the Donna Harta or the Ibra, there was a banking restructuring agency in Korea that was about to sell off this really, really broken bank. The deal was closed in 2000, in the year 2000, uh, for 500 million. Uh, TPG wrote an equity check of 100 million, leveraged up another 400 million. So it was, you know, a half a billion uh, asset that they bought. That was in 2000. They sold it away five years later in 2005 to Stanchart. So it's, it's now called Stanchart KIP for 3.6 billion. Uh, and you know, for those of you who are interested, flip up your calculators right now and just look up the IRR on that $100 million equity check. Put some humongous assumptions around the debt interest rate and you'll still get a huge IRR on that deal. So, bottom line is this is actually quite an exciting time now for private equity funds because they've got good drug powder, debt is still healthy, and there's some good valuations, good targets out there to be had. Let's now look at Asia with a little bit of a closer lens. So the chart here basically is sort of breaking down that global bar deal value that you saw earlier on into the geographic region. Yeah, PE in Asia is still pretty much in its infancy. It's still not quite where it is. But, but the good news is it is starting to grow. And if anything, if you look at what's happening out there in terms of fundraising, we believe that that's actually going to be a lot more deal activity in, in Asia in the coming months. There are a lot more sector, sorry, geographic specific funds that are being raised right now. So Bain Capital Asia is now raising fund two, where previously Bain Capital had been a pretty much a global fund or at the very most focused in, in Europe. Bain Capital is now raising Asia fund two. There are other funds that are being raised just specifically for Asia. If you break Asia down to some of the component countries, you know, Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia peaked in 2007, 2008 with something like 12 billion US dollars of deals being made in private equity. Uh, it's come down a long way since then. Right? It's now down to about five or so. Um, and, and what's driving that? Well, part of the reason is because the deal sizes in Southeast Asia are small. There are not that many big $5 billion deals that you can go and have out there. And if you're a GP, if you're working in the fund, 
Right, and you've, you've been given, you know, let's say you, you work for, I don't know, TPG, they've raised an Asia-based fund, it's $5 billion in total, and you have a five-year window to invest that $5 billion fund. You're not going to be chasing a whole bunch of $100 million deals in Southeast Asia. You'd probably be looking at sizable deals in China, sizable deals in Korea, sizable deals in Japan. And therefore, the deal activity in Southeast Asia has started to come down. Is that bad news? Well, not really. We've surveyed LPs. Uh, sorry, I use the term GPs and LPs, and I just realized that because a lot of people here are familiar with private equity, I should probably define what LPs and GPs are. GPs are effectively people who work in the funds. They're the general partners. They're the ones who take the, the money from the LPs, who are the investors, the limited partners. They take the money from the LPs and then they invest it. So, and, and how are they compensated? Well, they're compensated on a certain proportion of the capital appreciation of the fund, right? Commonly known as carry interest. So, just to give you an example, uh, if you buy an asset which is half a billion dollars and you sell it for three billion dollars, you know, let's say it's fully it's it's full equity as opposed to debt. If you if you buy it for half a billion, you sell it for three billion, you basically make two and a half billion dollars. A private equity fund will then earn a carry interest on that two and a half billion, and it's typically twenty percent. So, if if that was the number, two point five billion, they would make five hundred billion out of that out of that little deal, right? Um, and you know, if you're a partner in that firm, if you're a partner in a private equity firm, you will have a portion of that, of that, uh, of that uh, two, of that five hundred million dollars that you just made. So that's that's the difference between LPs and GPs. But here, here's a chart that actually was based on a survey that we did on LPs and what their perspectives are in the different markets in Asia. And the chart, the, the the black, the gray bars are 20, 2010, and then the red bars are 2011. Now, in, in, it's, it's always been a story of China and India, right? Because we've seen some mega deals being done in China, mega deals being done in India. People have made a lot of money from that, right? Uh, India, the blockbuster deal that was Tally, uh, Barty Chan Ventures, Volvo Pink has bought into that in, I think it was 1999, we sold it in 2004, made a ton of money from that. And since then, they've basically gone in and invested, and it's been attracting a lot of deal. Uh, Shenzhen Development Bank in China, this was a deal that was done by Texas Pacific Group. Again, that was ginormous, huge, ginormous, as, as my friend Francesco would say, ginormous alpha that was generate, generated from that. And because of that, there was a lot of attractive, uh, attractive deal making happening in China. However, one of the things that we're starting to see is that LPs are saying that, well, you know, it's getting crowded in China. Every time a deal comes up in China, I get 18 different private equity funds looking at the same deal. And when you start bidding, you know, if you have 18 people in an auction, they're going to bid up the price, right? Versus when you have two, or better yet, when you have one. So if you look in somewhere like Southeast Asia, actually there's not a lot of folks looking at it, right? Um, especially if you're looking at deals which are of a certain size. I'll give you an example. Uh, Excel Comindo. Anyone knows who Excel Comindo is? They're a, a mobile operator in Malaysia. Actually, they're owned by Exeata. Sorry, Indonesia. They're owned by the Exeata Group. They own a lot of towers, mobile towers, all across Indonesia. And they were going to plan, plan to spin off the towers business from the, the entity. Uh, deal was valued anything from 800 million to 1.2 billion. That was a big size deal. That one attracted 17 different private equity houses to that deal. Uh, we were called up to support at least four of them, and we had to back up a few because there were just huge conflicts of interest. <laughs> then a few months later, another deal came up. It was a two hundred million dollar PPO small shop in Indonesia. It only attracted four houses, right? And out of which, by round two, two of them backed up. So you can see that you know Southeast Asia presents itself with a if you like a whole range of opportunities. Yes, there will be some big deals that will come along. And yes, when those big deals come along, you'll have to compete with the Walker Pinkuses of the world, with the Bain Capitals of the world, with the KKRs of the world. But there will be still some small size deals where it's only the mid market funds that will go in there. And you know, if you're a mid market fund investor, that's actually quite attractive. Right? So I wouldn't be so quick to write Southeast Asia off. I wouldn't be so quick to write Malaysia off. The other thing that we are starting to see in Southeast Asia is the emergence of some very, very active buyers and very active owners. This is a chart looking at the deal that was generated between 2007 and 2010 
uh, across Malaysia, and you'll see some familiar names there. You know, Kazana has been a pretty active uh, buyer. Uh, EPF, uh, they're starting to actually allocate some money into, uh, into PE. Uh, and then you have CBC, Sipia Match Capital, Marseille, Texas Pacific Group, Attic. Um, and then you have some of the other smaller ones as well. So, so you'll see it's, it's quite a, a whole cross-section of them. The other thing you'll pick up here is they're starting to be very country-specific funds, right? Nevis is one good example. It's very specific to Malaysia. Equinus, another Malaysian, very specific Malaysian fund. But then in Indonesia, you'll have folks like Northstar, Kuvat, very, very focused in, in Indonesia, haven't really expanded. And then you'll have you know, the other big ports, KKRs and so on and so forth as well. When you get down to this range, yes, there are a lot of players out there. But the other thing is, you'll notice that the big boys are not there. Like all the big players, and you gotta stay away from that because it's just too difficult, right? And so this is actually, to me, an exciting space for a small size fund. Uh, one thing to kind of grow its presence in Southeast Asia, one thing to grow its presence in the You should have stayed right at the start and then if you have any questions, just feel free to interrupt me and ask. I know that the organizers have allocated some time at the end for Q&A, but, ah, there you go. <laughs> Right, so, so it goes a little bit back to what I was saying before, right? If you have a $5 billion pot of money to invest, and by the way, if you don't invest all of that by the end of that period, you have to give the money back. And, and when you give the money back, the next time you raise money, those LPs will be very nervous about giving that money to you because you just don't have the ability to invest my money. I might as well go and invest my money somewhere else because I know that if I give my money to you, you cannot invest it. But if I have a deal, if, if a fund has a deal size of five billion and it has to invest all of it in five years, then they are likely to be chasing the big deals. Right? Because then you know they'll work over the course of the five five years, they might work on I don't know, 50 deals, right? Uh, of which they may close 10. Right? If they were to start looking at a whole bunch of one sub 100 million dollar deals, they're looking at thousands of and I don't know whether you've noticed, but a typical private equity house in Asia, even some of the big boys, they'll have a total staff size of 20. Right? 20 people looking at 1,000 deals in five years. I mean, yeah, you know, they're only 24 hours in a day, seven days a week, right? So, any other questions? Again, feel free to stop me. So, next piece of data, uh, fundraising. This is another, another kind of telltale sign that, you know, the the industry in Southeast Asia is starting to pick up again. Barrick's um, Private Equity Asia, uh, the first fund that they had was 350 million. Look at the second fund that they had, like 2.5 billion. Um, do you know why they're able to raise such a big fund? Well, the big success story for them was Quartz. Quartz, Mammoth Ma Ma Superstore, Quartz, the, uh, the, the electricity and furniture retailer in, uh, in Malaysia and in Singapore. They turned around the company, made tons of money out of that. The LPs took interest. The LPs said, wow, you know, what a fantastic new management team that Barry's had. And so from a $350 million fund, they're now raising 2.5 billion. People are, LPs are starting to get quite interested in that. Uh, that is, you know, raising a relatively small fund this time around. Um, but, you know, partly because you know, the founding partners could be at retirement age, not so aggressive anymore. You have North Star, which started to hire a lot from global funds, right, to build up their team, raising a $750 million fund. So there's a lot of funds being raised, and these are Southeast Asia specific funds. So, and that capital, and if you do the math of that, that's a lot of money that that capital is going to be spent in Southeast Asia, in Malaysia, in Singapore, in Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam. And you'll see a lot more activity coming out as, as a result of that. What's the story in Malaysia? It's the best way to describe it is it's in its infancy. It's been around for a while, but it's still relatively in its infancy. So the chart on the, I guess on your left, my right, um, shows the number of deals that are done in total between 2010 and 20, October 2011, which is very recent data, in, in Malaysia. So 637 deals of, actually we have a threshold of greater than 10 million. 637 uh, deals greater than 10 million in, uh, in size, of which 
uh, private equity slash VC type deals are only about 6% of the total. We have seen, though, that there have been some exits by PE investors to strategics. Strategics are basically large corporations which have a strategic link to the company that's being sold. We've seen some exits by PE investors that effectively reflect some kind of influence that private equity have in the landscape of Malaysia. But it's still you know, relatively early days, right? There's still not enough activity. We think, though, that's going to change a little bit, and it's going to change a little bit more in the next five years or so. The reason why we think that's going to happen is, you know, to start off with, we're starting to see a lot of very active domestic players. So Kazana, if you like, have traditionally been a little bit more of a you know, kind of government-linked fund, sovereign wealth fund. Based on some of the activities that you see them do recently, they're a little bit more PE in nature, or at least some parts of the fund that they're managing it's behaving very much like a private equity fund. Uh, Equilus is another one, right? They're starting to, they have a very, a very strong government mandate on focusing on small, medium-sized enterprise. Uh, but they are starting to do a lot of deals which are effectively very PE package. The second one is the interest for foreign investors. And the big group of foreign investors that we're starting to see are actually the Middle Eastern funds, right? So Obadala, um, KMHMB, et cetera, et cetera, starting to make some significant investments, uh, especially in real estate sectors in, in Malaysia. But the last one, which is, uh, to me, the most important trigger point, is actually the growing track record of successful exits. As I said before, in, in India, the private equity investors have been in there for a long time, but it wasn't until Warhol Pinkus exited in 2004 and made tons of money there that all the other foreign funds started setting up offices in India, right? In China, it wasn't until TPG exited from Shenzhen Development Bank that, and again, tons of money there, that all the foreign funds started coming in. In Malaysia, we're starting to see that now. I mean, you know, Mitsui and Co, when, sorry, when Kazanas sold IAH to Mitsui and Co, right, the multiple on that was pretty attractive, right? The total size was, again, very attractive. When CDC sold Magnum back to, if you like a little bit of it, the, the, the corporate parent in the first place, MDH, right? Again, the multiple on that was relatively attractive, and it's nothing to attract some signs from, uh, from, from some of the big funds in the, in, the, in the global arena. So that's going to be, if you like, the, the CV or the resume for Malaysia as a private equity destination. Would you consider, I mean, I'm not very familiar with CIA. Yeah. 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 From other types of financial investors is the fact that they actually do active turnaround of the assets or the portfolio companies that they get into. So, if, if if that's what they did, and then they sold to Asahi at a pretty sizable multiple, then you know I would classify that as a very classic PE transaction. Do you know? Do you have a sense of what the multiple? Well, was? Yeah. 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 So I don't know whether you can hear. Uh, what what Ferdas has said, but basically, uh, CI bought into a drinks business, uh, turned it around, sold it to Asahi for 4x uh, what they bought it for. Right? How long was the holding period? Five years. Five years, six years. 4x in five years, six years, that's very attractive. Right? That is, that is kind of in the range of what the global funds would be looking at as well. One of the things that is going to be a challenge for all the general partners, all the GPs, all the funds that operate in. Southeast Asia will be return expectations. What do I mean by that? If I'm an investor in a private equity fund, I would expect certain levels of return because the risk profile is much higher. Right? Uh, I have other asset classes that I can invest in. I can invest in property, I can invest in mutual funds, I can put money in hedge fund. If I want to put money in private equity, right, the typical LP, again, this was based on surveys that we've done with LPs, the typical LP. If it's a global portfolio company, they would, you know, basically close to 40% of them would expect IRRs of greater than 16%. Right? 
right? But when you come all the way to Asia, that because Asia has a much higher risk profile for all these large investors that are sitting in Connecticut, sitting in New York, sitting in London, close to 80% of them will expect IRRs of greater than 60%. Right? Now, I think I was just talking to, I was talking to Iqbal, who I met, just met uh, uh, downstairs, and he was saying, and he, he's a, he, he works for a brokerage, and he was saying that the top performing fund in Malaysia, top performing mutual fund in Malaysia, was you know, what, grossing about 15% of IRR, right? So this is well in excess, right? well in excess. Um, Bain and company partners, by the way, are effectively LPs because we have access to a number of private equity funds because we, um, as I said before, a lot of our former partners are now you know, uh, founders and partners of these funds. And so when we put in money, you know, a lot of these funds, the, 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 the term sheet will come to us, the, the info memo will come to us, and we'll look at it and we'll say, okay, well, this one's attractive, this one's targeting a return of this much, etc., etc. For me, if it doesn't generate above 25% IRR, I will not look at it. I will not put money into it. My top performing fund, which is a fund run by one of my former colleagues, Jesse Rogers, he started Golden Gate Capital Fund 1, that crossed, get ready for this, that crossed 65% IRR. Okay. Made a couple of good bets, crossed 65% IRR. But that's the kind of expectations people have on private equity. Um, now, that's not to say that as a, as a whole, this is a very attractive asset class. If you take the total average of private equity funds and you look at the return profile, it's no better than any mutual fund. It's no better than any hedge fund. In fact, hedge fund as a whole, industry average, is much better than PE. But you, if you want to invest, you can invest in PE funds, pick the top quartile. This top quartile is when it generates a lot of interesting returns. I think in 2010, the top returning fund was returning 37% IRR, net IRR, which again is very attractive. Okay, but you know, obviously it's not all fun and games if you're in the private equity industry. So now looking at it from the perspective of the GPs, the fund managers themselves, GPs in Southeast Asia are starting to see a lot more competition, or they will expect a lot more competition. I mean, we saw the data before, a lot more funds being raised, right? So the data on the extreme left hand side, basically says that they expect, you know, 60% plus plus expects increase in competition in 2011 and beyond. In terms of valuation, you know, close to 70% of them say that they expect valuations to increase somewhat or increase significantly. Uh, and then they, they expect, 30% of them basically expect that closing the deal will now be a lot more difficult uh, because seller price expectations are higher. Once you get private equity funds in the door, in general, the promoters, the sellers will say, okay, well, you know, I'm not going to let go until I hit a certain threshold. Those thresholds generally increase when they have a lot of bidders being brought into the table. So it's going to be a little bit challenging for GPs simply because of this context that we see here. What do GPs need to do then is to adopt something we call activism, right? And I think Firdaus kind of describe a little bit what, what activism is all about. Activism is very different from the traditional PE funds, where the traditional PE funds, if you like, were more leveraged buyout funds. Right? They bought a company, they took all the cash out, they leveraged the company just enough to, to just to ensure that there's enough money to kind of pay back the interest and so on and so forth, but earned the delta with the interest tax share. Right? For those of you who study finance, you'll be able to figure out what, what I just said. Right? But it's basically a very basic model financial re-engineering model, change your capital structure, change your debt structure, take the cash out, make a lot of money from it. That was the model that prevailed in the US all the way until, you know, I'd say kind of the mid-90s, maybe even the late 90s. Anybody here heard about, anybody here read the book Barbarians of the Gate? Or even saw the movie? <laughs> there was actually a movie made out of it, it was a really horrible movie. Was it about okay, Clark so for those, Nabisco? Sorry? Was it about Clark Nabisco? It was about RGR and Nabisco, exactly, right? So, but that is, again, is a classic example of a leverage buyout deal, because this company was right with cash, right? And KKR wanted to get all of that cash. And so KKR was willing to bid much higher than any of the other, other firms, and in fact, higher than the management, right? Because originally this was structured as a management buyout, KKR kind of came and swooped in to get So, <clears throat> that model does not exist 
when I talked about the Korea First Bank deal that Texas Pacific Group did, right? Yes, in a sense, they bought it when this asset was in trouble, right? It was a bank that was close to bankruptcy, but they spent a lot of time turning it around. So in the first 18 months, they basically split the bank into two, the good bank, the bad bank, right? And the good bank, they found some way to kind of sell it off, right? Make anything that they can, right? And in some cases, they were making 20 cents to the dollar for whatever the bad bank could raise. Uh, the good bank, however, they invested, they did new branches, they reformatted the branches, and so on and so forth, to the point that when Stan Charter looked at it in 2005, they thought, wow, well, this is actually a very good platform for Stan Charter to get into the Korean market. And that's why they paid $3.6 billion for it. So that is the model for activism. It's, it's basically saying that I will go in there and I will actually actively turn it around such that I can extract a lot more value from it. Right? So if you look at how currently uh, PEV funds uh, exert control of it, you know, there's usually, and, and by the way, this is a, a shrinking group now. There's usually some board level participation. Okay, I'll plunge a couple of guys, sit on the board, and they will control my portfolio. That's not the model that they, they had anymore, right? Because I think the model that is now being more done is they will actually put some very uh, seasoned executives to actually run the business. So when TPG bought over Ducati, they actually put a new CEO in there and used that CEO to actually turn around. The other thing is, and this may interest people who are trying to get into the PE, business, they're starting to hire what's called portfolio professionals. And these are not deal makers, these are people who manage the portfolio. So if you look at Capstone, Capstone is the, if you like, the portfolio management arm for KKR, sorry, yeah, for KKR, uh, they have about 40 plus professionals now. Bain Capital has close to 40, 40 professionals that are looking specifically at managing the portfolio. So these are the guys that they will parachute into a company post takeover turn it around, get it to the valuations that they're uh, they expecting, and then sell it on, right? So, you know, percent of PE funds will change the level of portfolio professionals, you know, it's, it's on the rise, right? More and more of them are starting to hire portfolio management professionals as opposed to just deal makers. Our internal research essentially shows that activism does pay off, right? Because it's so hard to now find situations where you're basically buying an underpriced asset that you really don't need to do anything and you can just sit and wait for the money to come in, right? That doesn't exist anymore. So again, the industry need for a return multiple is 1.4x. Again, flip on your calculator, you know, assume that this is going to last for about five years. The IRRs on 1.4x is not that exciting. The IRRs on a 3.6x in a five-year period, that's very exciting. Right? And what we've seen is that there is a difference between uh, late intervention, no intervention, and early intervention. And what I mean by intervention is basically from day one, the minute that the private equity fund buys the company, they're already actively working on it. They will go in there, they will make some changes to the management team, they will have, if you like, a 100-day plan, and they will maniacally execute and monitor the progress around that 100-day plan. And for those that do that very diligently, you know, it's 3.6 to 4x multiples, right? The kind of multiples that Fred was referring to when CI sold to, uh, to Asahi. And how, how do they do that? Well, activism, to me, kind of cuts across the entire value chain of activities that a private equity fund would do. So what do private equity funds typically do? Well, they start by, the good ones will start by developing a fund strategy. So they're not going to chase after every single deal. They'll have a certain set of deals or a certain set of themes where they know that they have some kind of proprietary angle to make money. Right? Either it's capabilities that you have, or it's proprietary access that you have, or it's a type of asset class where no one has any interest in. So just to give you an example, First Reserve, uh, it's a fund based out of uh, Connecticut. Uh, again, they only look at energy. Energy is a very special asset class. A lot of people don't kind of understand energy. And so they find it's relatively a crowded space. They make a lot of returns. Um, colony Capital, very, very focused on real estate. Um, you know, again, a relatively uncrowded space. Starting to get a little bit more crowded now because people are starting to learn the tricks of, of, uh, of real estate investment. But there'll be situations like some of these uh, local country-focused funds, like Northstar, like Kuvat, they're banking on proprietary access, 
right? They're banking on the fact that they will see the deal before Goldman Sachs, before Morgan Stanley, before CBC, before Bain Capital, because they have that connection. Right? And I think in some situations in Malaysia, there will be funds that will have that kind of proprietary asset, whether it's Equitas, whether it's CIB private equity, whether it's EFAS Capital, some of these guys, because of their access to corporate Malaysia, will get access to some of these deals long before anybody else does. And if they're able to close the deal before this gets opened up to a 17 house bidding process, 17 house auction process, they're generally going to make a lot more money out of it. So identify the sweet spot. The next thing is actually deal generation and due diligence, right? A lot of PD funds now spend an enormous amount of time doing the due diligence. And at that due diligence stage, they're already starting to think about, well, how do I generate the upside? How do I generate the alpha that I need to generate to, to fulfill the needs of my, my LPs? And then, this is where the trick is, right? Close acquisition. After the acquisition this, and, and the ongoing management of it, they spend a lot of time making sure that this company does what it's supposed to do, right? From the 100-day plan, maniacally executing around that 100-day plan, making sure that it's right down. And then finally, working very specifically on an exit strategy. And traditionally, the exit was always an IPO, right? But, you know, in the case that, that Phil Dowes just mentioned, sometimes selling to a strategic is actually quite attractive. Strategics will typically price an asset, an asset much higher than, say, a secondary PE fund, or even the public, right, which is the IPO market, because the strategic is buying a particular asset because that asset helps this business grow. So in the case of, the, the, the case of this drinks company, I'm sure Ad Asahi was looking for a platform to grow their business in Malaysia. You know, this was the perfect asset for them. In the case of Korea First Bank, Stan Chuck was looking for a B-chain into Korea, and he found that that was the best platform. Right? So selling to a strategic, Typically a little bit longer, but the returns are generally higher than you know, the typical one. Uh, so that's all I have in terms of a kind of general description. Uh, kind of open to the floor now on any sort of questions. Uh, our, our gentleman MC introduced uh, me right up front and said that I was happy to take questions on kind of career building and game and so on and so forth. You know, happy to talk about that as well. If you want to talk about private equity, again, happy to talk about that. If you want to talk about management consulting, again, happy to talk about that. Uh, David Sim, uh, do you think that our PNP is a PE, a Malaysian PE uh, company? Um, I, I think PNB is your class, or at least in our definition, would be uh, what's called a government investment corporation. Right? And as a government investment corporation, it will basically put funds into different asset classes. So, and if you turn to to uh, to, to PNB, I think you know anything from a third to a quarter of your funds are actually allocated into equities, right? And those equities could be in the public market equities, right? Equity capital markets, or they could be private equity. I haven't seen them do too much private equity deal yet, uh, deals yet, so I would traditionally not classify them as, as a private equity fund. Right. That may change going forward, by the way. They may look at you know, PE as a very attractive investment, investing asset class, and they may say that I will allocate some portion of my fund into the Nevisus of the world, into even the CBCs of the world, or being capital. But it would probably be classified, at least in our definition, as a government investment corporation. Uh, I recall you said you look at IRRs go about 16% or 25%. 25. So with intensifying from competition, do you think you need to bring this threshold down? I, I have. I have for it. Yeah. So <laughs> it's not 25. <laughs> from what? It used to be much higher. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Well, just again, just to put it into context, right, you know, back in 2001, 2002, when, you know, we were looking at deals, right, uh, we were back then in those days in the heyday of private equity, you know, typical top quartile performing funds will be upwards of 35%. And so the expectation is that when you're putting money, you know, I don't want to put money in everybody. I only want to put money in top quartile funds, right, because I know that that's where I generate access to returns. If I put money in, one quartile, it's not doing any, in fact, some of them are actually negative, right? And so that's not very interesting. 
side, would you think that one of the reasons why uh, the market for private equity in Malaysia is not that great or big a size is because as all the good investments are held by government-linked investment corporations or state government corporations, investment arms of those? Yeah. A good, good example is the KFC holdings, which is what like Jay, Joe Cobb, I think the other day, Jay CBC or some other private equity wants to buy it, but I mean, it's, it's a good asset for them. And there's a few others as well, which yeah. I guess a lot of private people like to get a grab of it, but okay. they can't. Yeah. So let me just, if I can summarize and repeat the question, because I think the folks at the back couldn't hear it. So the question was whether or not the, uh, a, a symptom of why, or a root cause of why uh, deal activity, private equity deal activity in Malaysia is not as high as it should be, is because a lot of these companies are owned by, if you like, sort of some government fund of some kind, or government ownership, or GLCs. Uh, I actually have a very interesting perspective on this in the sense that I actually think there is a market for a mid-sized fund in Malaysia focused predominantly on GLC carbons. Right? And what I mean by that is going to every single GLC, finding that $200, $300 million company that you can cut out from a bigger conglomerate, which as part of the bigger conglomerate, the conglomerate is not doing anything. Uh, I will give you some examples, but I want to sort of first write a refusal to those things. Sandavi <laughs> <laughs> has plenty of those, right? Plenty of those. Uh, Jacob will probably have a few. <laughs> yes, Jacob will have a few, Sandavi will have a few, you will have, you know, UMW will have a few, Jumia will have a few, and so on and so forth. Right? So there is, and in fact, it's not just those kind of more traditional conglomerate companies. Even some of our more stable, sector-focused GLCs, like, say, Telcom Malaysia. I mean, Telcom Malaysia is actually a holding company for a whole bunch of different companies, right? There are some gems in there, which you can pick up and make quite a lot of money. Hi. Uh, just out of curiosity, do PE firms use uh, derivatives uh, in the deal-making process or in restructuring of the company? Sorry, say that again. Uh, do PE firms deal in derivatives? Meaning, do you engage in derivatives transactions either in the deal making process or in restructuring the companies that you buy out? Right. So, yes, so they will look in the fundraising stage and in the risk management aspects of private equity when they're doing a particular deal, they may take on some derivatives, right, just to hedge some of the, uh, the risks that they're doing. As, as, a capable, as a core capability, most PE funds are not, you know, master derivatives deal makers, if you like. Right? I think that's one kind of question that we're getting at. So they don't have, you know, a huge derivatives desk or anything like that. But they will seek the help of a financial advisor, an investment banking house, to structure some specific instruments to try to hedge some aspect of the portfolio if they feel that they're unnecessarily exposed there, or if they feel that that derivatives provides them with a a unique fundraising opportunity that, you know, kind of the classic debt capital market, equity capital market cannot help. Yes, go ahead. Hey, go ahead. Um, you're talking about, uh, when you're talking about big, you might be looking at uh, deals that are making billions, right? What I would like to ask is, um, how would you have any interest, forgive me if I'm missing for, how would you have any interest in uh, a deal such as Malaysia Airlines and Asia? How we, why, why would we have a deal of uh, interest in those things? Yeah. Okay, so I think it's a little bit in common knowledge now, and if you haven't read about it, it's in the blogs that we have supported uh, uh, the structuring of the Area Share uh, Malaysia Alliance collaboration. Right? It's not a deal, it's a collaboration. It's a CCL collaboration. Um, that was not part of our private equity. Arm, right? So, again, being a company is a management consulting firm, uh, that was more from an allied practice. Right? So, uh, the interest is going to be slightly different from sort of the private equity funds. The private equity part of our business will look at PE deals alongside the PE funds and, in some situations, co investment. In this situation, it was purely a professional services engagement. They brought us in to do certain parts of the work, uh, which obviously I'm not going to talk about. They, they brought us in to do some parts of the work, and it was a professional services consulting. Hi, I'm Sean, I'm from you, and um, just out of curiosity, um, from what you see, 
uh, in Malaysia, generally what sectors draw the most attention from PE firms? Thanks. So it's, it's I guess we've, I've been looking at this now for a good sort of 15 years, and I would say that it's been sort of all over the place. The one sector that I think is starting to get a lot of interest, uh, I would say in the last 18 months, is in the oil field services sector. Um, and that's because there are a lot, a lot of oil field services companies that could actually turn into very successful global companies with the help of some global investors. Uh, you may have read in the newspaper this morning that our local company, Sephora Crest Petroleum, has just landed a big contract in, in Brazil, right, with Petrobras, right? Um, Sephora Crest has no, up until this, uh, up until today, I don't think has any sort of engagement or any presence in Brazil. Uh, and, and it was probably a very hot struggle for them to get into that, that space. But if they had some form of global <coughs> investors, global financial investors, with you know, global coverage helping them as an active shareholder, I think it would, it would certainly help. What a lot of funds are talking to me about is that they're saying, hey look, you know, we've seen many oil booms in different parts of the world, the North Sea, the Gulf, and so on and so forth, and out of those oil booms, there were large local companies that became global companies. So in the case of you know, the North Sea, you had companies like Sea Drill, right, which is a, effectively a Norwegian company that kind of became one of the largest drilling outsourcers globally. Uh, so the question then becomes, well, you know, given how rich in, in oil and gas Southeast Asia is, could there not be um, a company that could be a platform for global expansion with the help of the right global investors? Right? So I'm starting to see a little bit more activity around that. But traditionally, it's been sort of all over the place. I mean, if you look at, if, if, you, if you have time, go into Nimbus Capital, look at the kind of investments that they've made. I mean, they've had, you know, cafes, they've had uh, uh, consumer goods, they have uh, you know, farms, natural resources, it's all over the place. What I would say though is, you know, going forward, you know, what you will see is funds being a little bit more specialized, going after things that they have a little bit more familiarity with, or that are trying to build a theme or a set of capabilities around. So it may actually kind of streamline into a certain set of themes, a certain set of industries. No, no, no. It, it's, uh, so it, they went. So yeah, I was using Sakura as an example. Sakura actually went in alone, right? And so the so flight that came there, they, they did everything alone. Or as far as I know, they did everything on their own, right? Um, and they may have used some contacts in Brazil and so on and so forth. But what I'm saying is that there are a lot of interest now in some of these other small firms that you know could very well do services outside of Malaysia, right? Given the right set of uh, uh, financial investors with global coverage. Sorry. Right, hi, my name is uh, Shannon. And, well, it's not really a technical question, but I was really curious about how, like, you've been around the world, right, doing m and in different countries and stuff like that. I'm wondering whether when you were younger, well, you're still younger, uh, <laughs> when you were starting out your career and you, you had not moved around the world, was it part of your plan to, like, I want to be in Tokyo, I want to be somewhere else, or did you just come along as, as you went along, it just grew as you went along. That's, that's my first question, like basically how did you plan? The second question will kind of be like, uh, I'm, I'm from IT Consulting, so it's, it's quite interesting when I was, I was seeing your slideshow and all, I think you, you presented it really well and it's very intriguing. And how, how, how would you say, like, uh, how would you advise someone who is not in finance or not in the industry who is interested to go into PE? Is it possible? These kind of things. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, so, to, to, so, let me answer the, the, the second question first, and let me come back to the first one. The second question is less personal. The first one is very personal. <laughs> and in general, I don't like to talk about myself. So, but let me start on the second one first. Um, there is an opportunity for you to get in. I think it, it goes back to one of the final slides that I showed, which is on portfolio management. Uh, you do need to have some basics in financial analysis, right? Because they, you, you're expected, even if you're going in there and doing some portfolio management of the company, to be able to put together some spreadsheets to then report back to the fund. Having said that, though, I think the funds are now also trying to build capabilities to help do some form of active management or turnaround in those portfolio assets that they buy. So if you look at the folks that 
uh, KKRs are in through their capstone office, it's not your pure Wharton MBAs with, with you know, quant skills or your Chicago MBAs with quant skills. It's a whole mix, and some of them are actually industry experts that have spent time you know, turning around industrial companies, right? So it's not something that can be a little bit more, if you like, more equally spread. Tr traditionally, in, in PE, it's, it's really been just consulting and investment banking uh, graduates that have kind of gone into PE. Right? So there, is, there, there are still ways. Um, if you want to go into the deal making side, though, I think you know some element of advanced finance will probably be required. Your first question on so so I left this country when I was seventeen. Um, you know, went off to the UK, studied there, ended up working in London for a while, um, and wanted to stay on in London for a little bit more. But but the firm that I was working for sent me back to Southeast Asia. Uh, because they were starting up an operations in Southeast Asia and they wanted a local. So I came back here, uh, but I was itching to move again. Right? And so did I plan it? No, I didn't. But I it just deep inside I had this passion to see the world. And, and that was kind of my, if you like, guiding force. Within Bain and Company, I mean, I was very fortunate that within Bain and Company, it is encouraged for people to move around. So uh, I joined Bain. Probably a few years after I graduated, in 1997, probably a few years after I graduated. And then and I joined what was then sort of a very small operations based on, uh, Southeast Asian operations based out of Singapore. And then from there I went to San Francisco, to Munich, uh, Sydney, Seoul, Tokyo, Shanghai, down to Sydney again, Paris, and then one more stint in, uh, sorry, Paris, Munich, Sydney, and then in 2008, I was made the offer to come back and start the business here, and I said yes. Right. Uh, I missed the local food, <laughs> and so I decided to kind of come back, and it's it's been great. Right. So the experience was tremendous. Right. The global exposure was tremendous. The amount of the things that I learned, you know, executing deals in China, supporting deals in London, uh, turning around companies in Australia, and then bringing some of those core skills back into the environment here. It's been tremendous uh, learning experience for me. And, and one that I would encourage all of you actually to try to get some exposure to. Um, you know, there will be, if you like, if you think about sort of the next five or ten years in corporate Malaysia, uh, there will be a huge need for people with that kind of global exposure, global experience, right? And uh, the folks who are who haven't actually kind of been around might become a little bit of a commodity, and it will be very, very difficult for you to compete against the next guy who, like yourselves, may or may not have gone you know, and worked many years abroad. So I would, you know, if possible, uh, obviously have your roots in Malaysia, but go out there, get some exposure, and then come back here and transfer all that learning into this environment. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> yes? So basically, I just want to check, right? Um, for the average returns, or the mean return for the PE, it's generally quite high. But the median of it is actually lower than the mean. Therefore, there are actually more deals that are not doing as well. But there's one blockbuster deal that actually brought the profits up. So what would you, from your perspective, what actually would encourage investors to actually consider PE as opposed to other alternatives of investment? So, so most investors, by the way, will have, the sophisticated investors will have a pretty diverse platform for them, right? So, by the way, just so you know, if, if you're trying to now, you know, after this talk, go and put your own personal money in private equity, it's not that easy, right? In the US, the only way you can put money into private equity is if you're what's called an AI or a QI, a qualified investor or an accredited investor. Uh, I think the minimum threshold in that is that you have to have earned, I think something like 250,000 US, two years in a row, you need an MBA, etc., etc. The threshold for investing in, in, in PE at least in the US arena, it's, it's actually very high. Uh, the entry ticket is also very high. Uh, just to give you an example, main capital in the global funds, not in the Asia, not in the Euro funds, in the global funds, the minimum check that they will receive, they will be willing to receive from an LP is 10 million US dollars. So unless you have some spare 10 million dollars by the back, then you know, it's very hard for you to get in. <laughs> Uh, so, so, and the way that Bain and company partners do it is actually we invest in our internal fund funds, which then has negotiated rights with all these other funds, right? Because again, we have all our, our, our colleagues in there. To your, your question around, you know, kind of where should we put it, I mean, like most of us, Bain partners, will have 
a very diversified portfolio. So personally for me, I have a lot of direct equities as well as private equity. I have uh, some money in debt. Uh, I have some Google of debt capital markets as opposed to loans. I do have that as well. <laughs> um, property. Um, I have some uh, 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 money in hedge funds, uh, some money in basic mutual funds, insurance. So it's a very diversified portfolio. And you know, as a, as, a, as a sophisticated investor, what you want to do is you always want to look at your portfolio and try to find some form of balance between the risk return that you're trying to make. Sorry, there's a question right now. One question from RHP Investment. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, then. Yeah. Uh, what's your opinion on Okay, what's your opinion on back back PE firms? I mean CIB has a PE in ARM, so is RHB. I mean, do they have an edge in the market? Uh, it, it's a very specific uh, sorry, it's a question that will be specific to the bank that we're talking about. I personally think CIMB PE is potentially quite powerful, right? Because you know, CIMB with the institutional access that it has in Malaysia will have a lot of access to deals, right? Uh, because they will have a lot of in a, uh, clients who will be looking at other asset classes. And right now, you know, the only asset classes that are available to them would be, you know, DCM, ECM, the, the classic ones, right? But now, you know, if they really sort of market it, they can bring to market a PE proposition to the institutions, and some say, hey, look, you know, we can actually help you with some PE funding as well. Right? So if you think about it, you know, there are a lot of banks that created these PE funds simply because it was a means to provide a broader value proposition to their institutional clients, right, or to their investing clients. Um, that being said, I think in general, though, you're starting to see a lot of uh, bank-backed funds pulling away from the bank, right? So the most recent victim would be HSBC Private Equity, uh, the founders, the, uh, the founding partners of that, and some of the other partners. By the way, one of the partners in, in Asia is actually in Malaysia. He lives in Hong Kong. He's very rich. Uh, no interest in coming back here to, uh, to Malaysia. They bought it out. They did an MPO of the fund. It's now called Headland, Headland Private Equity. Um, the main reason that, that they will say in in their pitch on why the buyout, the buyout is occurring, is that you know they're trying to remove the conflicts of interest, right? And there are conflicts of interest. I think when I said what I said earlier on, there were some stickers on the side of the room, and that's because there are some conflicts of interest when you say you know I'm CIMB and I have all this access to you. So they, they do that. They try to create that separation. My personal cynical view of this would be that when you are in a bank, you are paid, even though you are in a private equity business you're paid within the confines of the bank bonus structure. Now, if you think investment bankers get paid a lot with all those bonuses, you should stop looking at what private equity managers are doing. Right? And so that's why there's been a lot of spin-offs, because private equity fund managers want to earn carry interest and not just the straight banking bonus. Uh, hi, my name is Prabhu. Uh, what I'd like to ask is uh, two questions. First is, uh, you talked about AI and uh, SI just now in the US. And uh, for Malaysians, you know, the typical Malaysian, how much would you really need uh, to start investing directly in private equity or to even think of partaking in this? And number two, before you reach that stage where you have several million lying around, what should a, Malaysian, a typical Malaysian do? To, should he start learning, start investing in other sort of funds first and start learning up about private equity? That sort of thing. So, so I mean, maybe this is a little bit of a biased perspective here. I actually think that joining a consulting firm that has some form of access to PE funds is a very real way of learning how to uh, create value in companies, in short, right? Uh, sorry? I think everybody does it now, right? I mean, we created the market, but if you look at, at, uh, at uh, uh, PE support, PE advisory, I think all the funds kind of do it. CBCG will do it, Carney will do it, LEK will do it, etc. etc. Right? Uh, and they do it in different ways. But what, what, the reason why I say that is because then you'll learn the essence of value creation, not just financial value creation, but strategic and operational value creation. That when you then add all the sum, you then realize, okay, well, that's how we make money. Right? So, and, and, and when you learn through the ropes, you then become a very sophisticated investor. Right, that you will then look at an asset, right, and say, okay, well, you know, actually, 
this is a very interesting asset, right? And if I have enough cash, I'd like to kind of buy that company, reset its direction a little bit here, revamp its operations a little bit there, and actually help it grow, right? And that, by the way, is the reason why Jeffy Rogers left the company to start um, uh, Golden Gate Capital, why Mitt Romney and Bill Bain left to start Bain Capital, why Simon Pillar and Tim Sims left to start Pacific Equity Partners, and so on and so forth. Because through the years at Bain & Company, where they were helping large corporations and helping PE funds create value from all the assets that they were buying, they learned the skills themselves. Right? And so, so that would be kind of one advice I would have for you. The other question you have, I actually am less familiar with what the regulations are around private equity and investing for retail investing in Malaysia. I actually think you cannot do it. I, do, I at least I'm not aware of any uh, any avenues for that. Right? Um, certainly for the global funds. I mean, if there is, yeah, I, I guess P and B, for instance, will have access to main capital because they can write 10 million US dollar equity checks. Right? But even some of the mutual funds in Malaysia, the public, the RHPV, whatever, right? Uh, I think their funds are generally, their mutual funds are generally quite diversified. So each individual fund may not be able to write a single large enough equity ticket to, to, to participate in the local funds. Those are the global funds. The local funds, I don't know, right? I don't know how you get into, you know, never, you know they raise 75 million. So if it's 75 million, then I think they're quite open to smaller equity checks for the Yes. Okay. Uh, I really like the, the fact that the activism that you, have, because you, you, just, you just mentioned and uh, I really love the fact that you guys turn travel assets into good assets but I think it's always about exits but then, uh, if you guys are really good at managing all this, all this asset uh, does it, does it like, uh, there's times that where you should hold the asset rather than uh, sell it for that? Yeah, it's, it's a good point. So um, the exits happen for two reasons. One is, uh, there are very few uh, what's called evergreen funds. Evergreen funds are funds where the investors will put in money and expect some kind of dividend over the course of you know, the length of the fund. Um, whereas most funds are typically quite time, uh, time-defined funds, right? So you know, most of being, the, 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 this, this next main capital Asia fund is a seven-year fund, right? Uh, so basically, they're going to close the fund, launch the fund in 2012. By 2019, they will have sold off every asset and returned the money to all the shareholders, all the all the investors, all the LPs, right? So because of that, you will you do see a lot more exits um, than, than normal. There are certain situations where they might re-up. Re-up basically means like you know they, they put more money in, but they put more money from a different fund. So it may be Bain Capital Asia Fund Three. Right, that's not, they're taking the capital Asia, it's taking uh, funds from fund three and basically putting it into an asset which was bought from fund two, but then dispersing the funds that was actually put in in fund two. Right? So there may be some situations of that. Uh, typically, though, and you'll see these exits happening um, quite common, is when the private equity fund has already executed the 100 day plan. Right. The plan was set up that we will grow this, we will enter this market, we will you know, revamp the operation. That's done. Now, there's probably a next phase of growth right, with a new set of plans and so on and so forth. But for the private equity fund, I've already made my money in the sense that I've already created value. I can, if I really, really got a about that, we are to put more money in, or I pick the money out right now, perhaps sell it to a secondary, sell it to a strategic. Right? So, in the case of the real first bank, yeah, they could have gone into wave two of their growth, but they didn't. Right? So they sort of pulled out at, at, at the right time. They found a strategic buy. Was there questions on this? Yeah. Um, Raji Isudin from Frost and Sullivan. Yes. So my question is related to a forward thinking question. A forward? Forward thinking question. Forward thinking question. Next year, there is a possibility that Big Romney will become a president of the Obama. You yes. Big Romney is from the and company. So I heard he, he was a fan of management consultancy, so he planned to engage McKinsey to fix Uncle Sam's government. You know, so Uncle Sam's economy is that is screw up right now, right? So what's your opportunity on, what's your view on management consulting post for me moving forward, whether strategy consulting or whether PE? 
Well, as president of the United States, he's a former consultant, right? So, yeah. so, so, so our, our alumni is actually very far reaching. So, <laughs> I, so I, won't, I won't be able to comment specifically on Mitt Romney. I mean, to me, you know, he sort of left Bain and Company many years ago. Uh, when he was at Bain Capital, he used Bain and Company for DD work for, uh, for, for the turnaround. He also used ECG, he used Carney as well. Uh, so, you know, the, the association that we have with him is that he's no more than just an alumni. Uh, when he became governor of Massachusetts, he did pick a few of our more senior partners, brought him into the team in, in, in managing the state of Massachusetts, if you like. So, for instance, the treasurer of the state of Massachusetts was a gentleman named Kel Kendrick. Uh, Kel Kendrick Kel was actually the former CFO uh, of, uh, of Bain & Company. He left, became the treasurer of the state of Massachusetts, and has now re-entered Bain & Company, and is now the current global CFO of Bain & Company. So, you know, I, I would say that you know, the, there is no kind of direct association of any kind that we will have with it. Um, I would say, though, it is not uncommon for administrations to use consulting for some very specific purposes. Right? Malaysia is a good example of that, right? I mean, for those of you who either read papers, follow blogs, whatever, you know that the Bermandu and the Idris Jala spend a fair bit, I would say, on consulting uh, at the planning stage of the ETP. So he, he, put, he put up, and, and we were participating in that, uh, McKinsey participated in that, BCG participated in that, Ethos was in there, Accenture was in there, quite a number of different firms looking at each one of these NK, uh, what, what's, what he called the medium key economic, NKEAs actually, not the NKRs, the NKEAs, uh, economic activities. Um, and, and a large part of that was to try to tap onto the experience, the global experience of the consulting firms in helping transform certain aspects of the economy in Malaysia. And so it was like, I think it was an eight week study. Uh, where, where all these different consulting firms are going to kind of help set the plan in motion, working in conjunction with the private sector in Malaysia. We've seen a number of these situations that are also happening uh, globally for, um, for other government institutions. And then the last part is actually in the not-for-profit sector. Uh, there are a lot of consultants who are also hired. We actually have a sister company called Bridgepan, which if you join Bridgepan, the pay is actually half of what you would get in the company. But you join it because you're very passionate about doing work for not-for-profit organizations. And so in Bridgepan, our clients include the Clinton Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, Hands Across America, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's basically trying to help uh, find ways to solve all those problems. And, and again, it's essentially taking uh, very basic consulting tools, but applying in a very different domain. Right? And this domain would be not-for-profit. I have another personal question. Yes. So, uh, why, are you, why are you still with Bain Company? Why haven't you started your own like private investment house? <laughs> why do you think I haven't? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so why have I not left? Right. So I. Well, I'll answer that question, and we'll get to you. Right. So, okay. So I have not been with Bain for close to about fifteen years now. Um, what I do, and, and again, this is as you said, it's a personal question. So I'll share my personal experience. Every two years. I do a, if you like, a kind of a personal reflection on my career. Um, uh, actually, just before that, before I joined Bain, I actually started up a company on my own. Uh, that company was in operations for nine months. It was doing rather well. It was actually an operations consulting company. We were doing supply chain as we redesigned. Uh, my biggest client was every battery, battery, battery company of Indonesia. Um, and it was going well. Uh, but, you know, I was still very young, I didn't know how to run companies, it wasn't very successful. Nine months later, we ran out of cash. Right? If you're a company that relies on electricity to power up your computers to write code, not having cash to pay the electricity bills is not a good idea. <laughs> so, you know, in, in short, I sold my share, there were four partners, I sold my share off to, uh, to, to, the, part, to the other partners. They sort of found other investors, and that kind of that, that growing consensus sort of remained. Uh, in 1999, this was when I was in San Francisco. Some of the original partners came back to me and said, "You have this brilliant idea." I looked at the idea. I thought it was good. I wrote a business plan for it. Whilst you know, usually it's in the weekends, right? So in the weekends you have some spare time. I wrote a business plan, and because I was in San Francisco, I went to shop for some VCs to buy into that business plan. We managed to raise $2 million for that initial plan. Again, this was the dot-com boom, so money was everywhere. <laughs> so we managed to raise $2 million in San Francisco for a little 
you know, our, our little business, um, I won't, I, if you have time later, I'll tell you what the business is. Uh, but, but long story short, the business you know, had, had some manufacturing facility in Masjid Thailand and Malacca, selling products in Indonesia, Singapore, and Malaysia and Thailand. Uh, I was you know, basically sitting in San Francisco, kind of 45% of the company for the uh, business plan that I wrote in for tying up the VC fund. That business was sold two years later. Uh, of the four partners that had equity stakes in it, uh, two of them became quote unquote internet millionaires. My share didn't cross that one million mark. So, so, but it was still a very nice, healthy sum of money that I made from that. You'll find that in Bain and Company in general, that it's generally the DNA of the people that we hire uh, that we're all very entrepreneurial in nature. So, yes, you know, to answer your question, there's been a lot of that happening. Come back to why I'm still at Bain. Well, actually, what I'm doing now in, in KL is probably one of the most you know, entrepreneurial things I've ever done in Bain. Right. I come here in 2008 to set up the firm in KL, right? And unlike when I started my company before joining Bain, I have the backing and the resources of this huge company called Bain and Company, and they're all behind me, right? And I have my little sandbox to play with, and I can do whatever I want to it. It's incredibly entrepreneurial, but it's got managed downsides, right? And that's become very, very exciting for me. That's why I'm still here. And you know, I may not be here three years from now, five years from now, and, and maybe sort of moved on to some other enterprise knowledge. Or I may be in Bain, but maybe starting up an office somewhere else, starting up a practice somewhere else, or doing some other things. Right? But this is kind of part of the, uh, the value proposition. I don't want to sell Bain too much here, but this is part of the value proposition that we have, which is that you create your own careers with Bain and Company. Yes? Hi. It seems that um, activism investing seems slow and hard, especially in returns. So that the perception is, I'm saying perception because I don't want to accuse anything. The perception is that most private equity investors are blamed for speculative investing, creating bubbles and bailing out after making lots of money at the expense of small investors. We've seen many scandals and bubbles before this and often it is uh, these few people, very big amount of money being blamed to, which the recent Occupy Wall Street movement has been doing. So my question is, what are the uh, standard of transparency and corporate governance in this uh, private equity investment industry? Thank you. I, I don't think there's enough to, 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 answer your, to answer your question. I actually don't think there's enough. I think, you know, Don Frank, Babel uh, uh, Trace, some of these new kind of uh, policies do not do enough to address uh, the lack of transparency. I do think, though, that you know, local governments have started to play a, lot, a much more active role in stemming the creation of asset bubbles from, if you like, vulture investors, like primary funds. Uh, Korea, the Korean government really made a very strong move after Korea Exchange Bank, after Korea First Bank, uh, and what do you call it, the exits of Korea First Bank, the exits of Korea Exchange Bank. So they tried to kind of control a little bit uh, the, uh, the, the investments or the, the build up of the asset model for private equity investors. But to me, I honestly think that there is not enough to be done, just certainly not in emerging markets like Southeast Asia, for sure. I agree. Um, there's a well publicized mini plan in the property market, especially in the office space. And I guess that's not helped by the number of new projects coming up soon. With PNB, I'm not sure this one or not, but they plan to build the tallest building. And, uh, well, is, is it right the time for sort of like private equities, like Brookfield Asset Management, for example, who likes to invest in all these properties and all that, where they can mop up all this new space and sort of like get other companies from outside to invest? Uh, to occupy these places, like I think they they did some good job in New York and Canada and all that. So, is it right like place? Would you recommend for that? Or? You know, I, I I don't know per se to, uh, whether whether it's right or wrong. But I generally personally stay away from uh, what do you call it from uh, from office uh, real estate, if you like, like commercial real estate uh, in Malaysia, uh, particularly because I actually think that. Uh, there's not a lot of controls in place to protect uh, the value of, of any kind of investments that I've had. I, I have some retail investments in Malaysia, uh, sorry, retail property investments in Malaysia, but uh, uh, those tend not to be in quality. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure that on a case by case basis, 
on a property by property basis. You know, if you go through the due diligence, uh, there may be some levels of attraction. In general, though, I would say that kind of the market fundamentals are probably there, right? Uh, but it will have to be almost kind of one case. And the exit is probably harder than any other. Market. Probably, probably. And though actually, in the the entry is probably a little more difficult uh, given the restrictions around. Uh, uh, I just have a, a quick question. I just want to come back to the gentleman's uh, question uh, about the, uh, you know, uh, because I had lunch with the Tantri Dr. Zeti a week ago, and when we talk about the um, making uh, a stricter uh, in regulations in, in terms of the le le leverage and hedge fund and all that, uh, do you foresee the outlook of the private equity in Malaysia or South Asia? Uh, becoming even more, even more stricter in terms of regulation. Yeah, no, I, I, I personally I don't know because I haven't spoken enough to regulators in Malaysia about their own. My understanding is, I think there probably needs to be two sets of regulations. One is a set of regulations to protect the investor, right? So, you know, when we talked about qualified investors and accredited investors and so on and so forth, right, there needs to be some form of definition before uh, the retail investors can get to some of those asset classes which are deemed to be a little more sophisticated, like hedge funds, like uh, private equity, and so on and so forth. So I think there needs to be a set of uh, guidelines and regulations policies around that. Uh, there's also probably another set of, of regulations policies around protecting the assets themselves, especially with the way of private equity, right? specifically to the point around being the target of, you know, kind of, uh, uh, if you like, a very hostile type of uh, so there could be, but I, I personally don't know because I haven't sort of spoken to the, the regulators in Malaysia enough to understand. I do know that one of the, uh, and, and, and you, you will probably find this out when you, know, when you go into the uh, ATP websites and so on and so forth, that actually credit is a much more uh, inviting environment for investors uh, in, into Malaysia is, is, if you like, the general theme of, uh, of the regulators right now. So, they need to kind of strike that, that fine balance between sort of creating too much regulation that restricts the attractiveness of PE funds making investments in Malaysia, be it in the entry as well as the exit, uh, but also at the same time protecting both the individual and the assets in Okay, uh, the last one is uh, I would like to ask you about the young investors like us. Sure. Um, I mean, as a layman term, what, what would you advise to, to us, really? Um, whether where do we put in our money? Is it according to the emerging markets or the, the RIC block or just in Southeast Asia? Uh, as you, of course, I, I remember your your uh, presentation. You can see the uh, lower risk is in the uh, Southeast Asian markets where it's more stable, but it's, uh, the higher risk will be on the riskier part, which is the, the RIC block. Yeah. So where where do we put our money then? <laughs> Uh, okay, don't take this as my investment <laughs> advice to you guys because I'm not a qualified investment advisor. <laughs> um, no, well, I, I guess for me personally, I mean, as, as a general advice to young investors, I think take the opportunity to learn how to invest in this really turbulent time, right? They don't happen very often, and when they do, when they do it creates a lot of learning opportunities. And you don't necessarily need to learn by putting a lot of cash into it. You can create your own little tracker, right? And create synthetic, uh, it's as easy as setting up an Excel spreadsheet, saying, okay, well, I pretend that I just bought into this, right? And you know, let's see how it grows and let's see how it makes it. And learn how to read the market in your own way. There are a lot of ways and there are a lot of tools and there are a lot of analysis that you can pick up. You know, you do a finance course, investment course, you go to MBAs and so on and so forth. I would always say that you know, kind of at the end of the day, it's up to kind of your own personal um, risk appetite, your own personal comfort level with some of the tools, right? So you know, I don't use as many as the sort of models that I have learned how to use. I just generally don't use them. I tend to look at sort of the more basics of the situation. Before I make an investment, um, I'll, I'll give you an example. So, uh, back in the Asian financial crisis, uh, MPF, I think the name of the company was MPF, it was uh, the, the father was, was, I think it was Tan Sri Boy, the, the boy that we had passed away, the youngest son had take, taken over in 1999, they were, they were just at risk of being default. default right? 
and you know, you pick up the research reports and you go through all of them, and you realize that the only thing that the banks could do is to roll over, right? Uh, and that's the right thing to do. The share price had gone down to, it became a penny stock. I went in bid, right? And literally within two weeks of that, after the whole sort of situation transfer and all that, I started seeing that penny stock grow, right? And by the time I exited, it was beautiful. Maybach is another one during the Asian. And by the way, I'm using the Asian financial crisis of 97, 98 because that was when I was your age, right? So, uh, and it was my living ground to my own sort of investments, right? And and you know, Maybach was another one. I mean, I don't know whether those of you who are in this room, you may not remember that at one point in time, Maybach went down to two ringgit per share, right? That was a long time ago. But for those of you who bought when Maybach was two ringgit per share. You will be, you know, very handsome compensated. What I did was I bought it at two, I sold it at four, picked it up at three sixty, sold it at five, picked, and I cycled about five times, and I finally exited at around fourteen, right, and made a lot of money out of it. But it's it's basically kind of reading some of the signs, you know, getting access. I'm sure you all have Google access, you all have access to analyst research reports. But form your own conclusions. Don't take it on face value. Right? Just form your own conclusions. Go into some of the fundamentals of the business, right? Which hopefully, if you join a couple like gaming companies, you'll know how to understand some of the business fundamentals. Go into the fundamentals of the business and then form your own conclusions and then act upon them. And then if you don't have a lot of capital, which I didn't back then, you don't have any capital put into it, then just create a little Excel spreadsheet and learn it from that Excel spreadsheet, right? Just track it and, and go on. So that would be one advice that I would give to, to young investors. All right, on that note, can we give uh, Mr. Perry a few last thoughts?